Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Today I have a very special guest, Dr. Shadi Al Masri. Uh, welcome. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for having me. Definitely. And uh, so I'm very excited for this interview because uh, maybe you guys know last week I had uh, Sheikh Mohammed Yasir Al Hanafi and we, dis we discussed different madhabs and how do you choose a madhab as a revert, which is a very strange experience. So mm -hmm. uh, this, this time I want to go more into something which is more controversial because madhabs are typically still fine, but the Akida issue is uh, is definitely something which is, uh, I can see from just the comments of people watching, it splits the Ummah. Or my first question may be, just jumping straight into this, um, about the branding itself, before we talk about Ashari or Athari or Maturidi, should I just say to you right now that I'm a Hanafi madhab and Ashari Akida, or should I just keep quiet? Like, um, do, do Muslims um, publicly acknowledge what is their madhab and what is their akidah, or is this something that you shouldn't be doing? Because I've seen some people, they post it everywhere that this is their akidah, this is their madhab, and some people don't even know what this is. Of course, a lot of people don't even know what this is. And then some people just uh, just keep to themselves. So what, what would be your advice for somebody maybe like me who's just trying to find kind of find myself in these terms? And I'm a Hanafi right now, but maybe I, I won't be the Hanafi forever. So how do how do I go about branding myself um, publicly? You know, well, I think that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, al -Muslimun. he named you the Muslims. And so Muslims should be the number, the 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 real, true and final uh identity marker that a person should have and every muslim person is is, is deemed to be innocent until they until they do something that would indicate that they're astray so uh principle number two is that a person muslim should never go about asking other people's aqidah uh, the only time that there's value in saying i'm this and i'm that is in the process of of learning and studying so if I'm if we're sitting with different people and I need and it's a solely a, it's like a scholarly discussion or I'm a student and I'm seeking a teacher, then it's useful for me to know what their what what the conclusion they've made is. OK, what is their conclusion? So this is uh, I only find that it has any value in in scholarly endeavors, whether you're a student or scholars amongst themselves. Right. So that I should know what instead of you telling me. I've come to these 50 conclusions, right? You could just say one word, right? And that's the only function of these labels is to, to, to quickly summarize what conclusions you've come to. And most people haven't really come to the conclusions, but they've agreed with the premise and then they uh, uh, become educated followers after that, right? That's like most 99% of the scholars of the world right now are... Are, they're educated, but they, they the, the premise and the main points themselves were derived by somebody else. That's simply because most people don't have the amount of knowledge needed to become what's called the mujtahid. Okay. So, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you understand what you're believing, because you're responsible for what you believe and what you teach. But other than that, uh, these markers can be more dangerous and divisive than than anything else. And why people put them up? Because knowledge is something that is so um, profound that people love it. So they they come to a conclusion, they read a conclusion, they read an answer by somebody, and they fall in love with the madhab. They fall in love with the scholar. So I view that pretty innocently, that people love, they just love their scholarship, Right. Uh, in Europe, they're going to say, I'm an Everton fan. I'm a uh, whatever, uh, uh, Real Madrid fan or something like that. Why? Because they love it. But love of knowledge, at least it's praiseworthy. Mm -hmm. As opposed to love of lehu, just games, right? And sports. But love of knowledge, there's some praiseworthiness. So maybe you could say there's some, it's not the best thing, but I, I don't really hold people at fault when they share how much they love you know something that they're studying yeah makes sense now when it comes to the topic of choosing your akida and i mean even the sheikh yasir muhammad al hanafi pointed out that the akida is very uh, the akida is very simple and mm -hmm. we shouldn't overcomplicate things however there's twitter 
there's YouTube. Mm -hmm. And basically, we see the debates and it's out there. It's not a scholarly debate anymore. Everyone is kind of diving into the debates which they shouldn't even touch. So we will be affected by it. So I think there should be some mechanism for converts or born Muslims who are just learning about their Akida to figure out how do I choose the Akida? Because with the Madhab, I understand it's more about the preference. For example, I, I'm a Mahanafi because it's impossible for me to be, for example, Maliki because when I'm hosting a Juma, we are not, we don't meet the criteria for Juma to be valid. So in the Hanafi right. Madhab, we do. So obviously, I'm not, I can't make things more harder than it's already uh, here. This is the only right. country where Islam is not recognized in the world. I think maybe mm -hmm. in Vatican as well. So, but with the Akida, how do I go about choosing it? Because I don't think there's a right way to choose the Akida because as far as I understand there are mainly three ways of Akida the Asharis, the Maturidis and maybe the Athari Akida but people define it differently depending on what their worldview is so if you ask a Salafi he will have four Akida types <laughs> if you look mm -hmm. at the Ashari Akida they give you Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jama'is Ashari Maturidi they won't include the Athari sometimes so for people for laymen it creates like uh, well, who should I follow? Because I don't even know, you know, these terms. It's the first time I'm hearing it. I don't know if I'm Ashari, Maturidi or whoever. And now I don't want, I will later get into the discussion about uh, Yad and the hand of Allah and all that. But first of all, how should we even approach studying the Akida? I believe that it's only a question. It's only a matter for someone who is going about studying. So choosing even a madhab in fiqh, it only has value for someone who it decides, makes the decision that they're going to learn at any level that they're going to study this, their religion, and they're going to learn. That's the only person that that choosing a madhab has any value to. Other than that, the, the guy who says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a very busy surgeon. I don't have time for this. I'm just going to go with the local community, right? So mm -hmm. that's his madhab. And that's all the books say this is not like my idea. Yeah. So. Uh, the choosing of the madhab is only by the one who says, you know what, now I'm going to study. So in the same vein, when you studied surgery, right, when you wanted to become a surgeon, you you chose a medical school, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, they had to accept it, but you did choose a medical school. You can't study in three different schools. You can't say, I like Harvard. I also like Yale. I'll take 50-50, right? I'll take the courses where I want. It doesn't work like this, right? So they, you need one curriculum from top to bottom. Is this necessary in religion? No, your prayer could be valid in other ways, but this is the best way. It's the most consistent way, and it's the way of all the scholars. So you choose your 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 premises first. You choose your um, your principles first. Okay, you choose the imams first. Then you follow what they give you. Okay, that's the best way. We can't say it's the only way. It's not the only valid way to live your life as a Muslim, but it's the best way, and it's the way of all the learned people. So. In the same vein, once the person one once the person begins to say, "Well, now I'm going to study Aqidah," he does the same thing. He studies the principles first. Like, what are the principles of Abu Hamd al Ghazali, which he outlined about the Ashari school? Because probably it's easier to learn the Ashari school from the books of Ghazali than the books of Al Ashari himself, right? Uh, and or you could study the books of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. What are what were his principles? Okay. And he didn't even outline them in, in, any, in any one single uh, text, but uh, you can find them, and so on and so forth. You study the principles, and in the main, your aqidah tended to be uh, a tabi or follows your madhab. So Malikiya or Ashaira, Shafi'iya or Ashaira, Hanafis can be Maturidis or Ashaira, and Hanabila or Hanabila or Ashaira. My, there's a minority of Hanbalis mm -hmm. who had an Ashari uh, slant towards things without the Kalam portion, but the in terms of the Tanzi uh, transcendence of Allah and the attributes portion, they followed uh, the Ashari, such as Ibn Jawzi. Okay. So that's the value. We have to understand what's the value of choosing a madhab. And that's the methodology. You choose the principles, you choose the shayuk, the leaders, the founders. Uh, you study the contemporaries and they say, okay, this is what my heart feels comfortable with. Now, keep in mind, you're responsible for this decision. Being a muqallid does not mean you're ignorant. Okay. it it Of everything, I should say. You do know qat'i knowledge. You do have certain necessary knowledge that's present there in the Quran and present in the Hadith, right? There are certain things that do not need fiqh. 
Mm -hmm. right? That Allah exists, that the Prophet is the last messenger. Certain things do not need fiqh. Okay? So that Allah is the creator of the entire world. So you use that knowledge that you have, okay? And you make a judgment on who is the most worthy person of following. That's what Qazi Ayyad, that's how he put it. Okay, you use your necessary knowledge, you use the intellect Allah gave you. It's no different than choosing a mechanic, choosing a lawyer, choosing a real estate agent, choosing a, 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 an oncologist, choosing a spouse. You don't know the future. I don't know the future of how you're going to behave, how you're going to look. I don't know the future of your, I don't know your genetics. It's unseen to me. I don't know um, your past 100%, but I'm going to use what I do know to make a decision. And that's how we make decisions in life. So it's the same way in choosing a madhab. A madhab. So, so choosing a madhab, would you say that sort of follows by choosing the Akida afterwards? Because, for example, let me give you a scenario. I accepted Islam. You know, I have no idea what this is. I'm dealing with my family. They kick me out. I'm dealing with uh, the society pressures. I'm dealing. I don't even know how to pray. So no way I'm going to talk about madhabs. No way I'm it's discussing. Irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I need two years to get to speed. Like, that's what I needed. Like for two years, I didn't want to hear this because I, I've seen these debates, but I didn't care. I did. I was it's irrelevant. My, yeah. my identity was not built as a Muslim. So I felt I need to work on this first. Yeah. And even just convince, not convince myself, but even like be secure in like you're a Muslim now. You were not a Muslim for 30 years. So this is a big challenge. But after some time, there comes a point, whether a river or a born Muslim who's like now practicing, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, that you say, well, this is not enough. Because, for example, I used to pray. I was mixing up madhabs. You know, I was raising my hands. I was doing whatever I just saw other people doing. But then I was like. I'm not sure I'm, you know, this is not enough for me. Like there must be like some way to follow this. And I, my, one of my friends is a Maliki and he, he just said like, it's much easier if you follow like one madhab, like it, it just yeah. gives you guidelines, but I viewed it like, I don't want to be like limited, you know, uh, or like follow this chef forever. And uh, because like mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of maybe, maybe it has some bad uh, perception, but yeah. So then I, I I became interested in it, and also it was because I was uh, I opened the masjid here, and I was starting yeah. to do jumas, and I was like, "There's no one else. Like I need to do, I need to upgrade. Like I, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's simply like this. Like I didn't have a choice. So at what point do you think people should be delving into madhabs or akida issues uh, in their Islamic journey, uh, whether converts or whatever normal people who just pray? They don't have time. They are busy. I'm also busy. I have a child who's screaming next door. So uh, yeah. what, where do you see that? Like, uh, Because for for me, it was like, I went to Umrah and yeah. I said, I've heard one Sheikh said, said, said like, when you go to Umrah and you come back and you're the same, something's wrong. Like you have to change. So I came back and I was like, really, um, I was like really serious about this. I'll give you a good analogy. Um when do you need a, 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 a human resources policy? You don't need one if you're the, the, the sole uh, uh, the proprietor of your business, right? The, the guy who mows lawns, every day he just mows a lawn for somebody. He doesn't need a human resources policy book, right? Um, a guy who has a little pizzeria with two people, he doesn't need a human resources policy book. But now you come and you open a company that has now a 50 employees, 20 employees, soon you'll have 100 employees, you need a human resources policy book, right? So the policy book really, the medheb, what it does, it doesn't say, this is the only truth. This is not what we're saying. But we are saying that when there's a fork in the road for this company, we're going this way, okay? When there's a fork in the road in this uh, element, of this decision making, we're going that way. Okay. So that's where the madhab is valuable. And if you have a if you have a Juma, for example, so Juma, you cannot, uh, you have to go right or left, right? Either the Juma will be in English or it'll be in Arabic. Okay. Either you have uh, uh, the Imam gives the khutbah and the prayer, or he doesn't. Okay. You can't do both. You understand? So wherever you have a situation where you have to make a policy for everybody and there has to be a decision, that's where the madhab comes in place. And 
When you announce it, you say, listen, we operate on this method. Oh, why? But there are other truths. I'm not saying it's the only truth. My masjid, the masjid is not the arbitrator of the truth, but we have to make a decision. How many rakahs are you going to pray for tarawih? Right? All these questions, a decision has to be made. So where a decision must be made, and it affects many people, and it's the right of people to know, how are you making this decision? Is this just Jan's uh, uh, desires? He flips a coin, what mood he's in, right? To remove all that subjectivity, we say, listen, we're going to follow this madhab, right? Let's say, so you're in Slovakia, probably a little bit of a distance from the Ottoman lands, but there's some Hanafi history there, let's say hypothetically, right? So you say, okay, it does make sense to latch onto that close history, right? Or I have a lot of Desi people here, Turkish people here. So there's a logic behind it, and there's consistency. And then you go to the main Hanafi book. Hey, guys, you want to know how we're going to do things? This is the book. I have a policy book. So people should not wonder and or, or th mistake us and say, we say this is the only truth. No, this is the most practical way to go about making uh, judgment calls, where we're not the ones who are going to make the judgment calls. We don't have the, the qualifications to do so. So we're going to follow someone else's judgment calls. Someone who's... Mm -hmm. Judgment calls has been accepted, not only accepted, it's been tried and tested throughout the world. So I don't actually have to worry about this judgment call leading us astray. If it, if this, the Hanafi school would have led people astray, all of India and Turkey and Egypt and Syria would have been astray a long time ago, right? So I think right. that's the utility and the value and benefit of having a, when you run a masjid, you need to have a policy. I'm not saying you have to, everyone else has to follow this. I'm saying what the masjid, when they do make decisions, group Ibada, like Juma, things like that, they need a policy. And the people have a mm -hmm. right to know what the policy of this mosque is. The people don't have to, they don't get a, it's not that they get a say, but they have a right to know what the policy is. Yeah. So now this is maybe more divisive, but let's break down uh, how do we, categorize the Akita itself because for example uh, especially for new converts you see this it's obvious especially even a few days ago there was a huge debate between a Christian and a Muslim who's an Athari and there was a huge Ashari pushback on Twitter like it's it's disgusting what's happening like really the Adab there's nothing I uh, left this from both sides I, I left all that stuff I'm yeah. not even obvious it's become like corrodes your heart it really corrodes your heart yeah, and it, it creates, uh, for maybe not for you, but for, for someone who's not settled in the deem, it creates big doubts. Like, look, yeah. these are the scholars, or these are people who debate and they behave like that? Like, what's going on? Uh, and subhanAllah, I just, and even a scholar that I read a few years ago, I looked at one of his videos and he was lying about Abu Hanifa. Like, I read his book and he, he's not saying the truth. So I'm just like, subhanAllah, something's wrong here. So let's break it down. What? How would you... For a layman, uh, define the Maturidi, Ashari, and Athari creed. And what, because the reason I'm asking is 99% of converts are Salafis. This is the reality. There is no Ashari Dawa in this region. Uh, because I don't know why, but this is just reality. So the most Dawa materials, the most um, online Dawa is always from sort of a Salafi perspective, which is fine because they bring people into Islam, like a lot of people, like, but, so I'm just wondering, how would you break down these three Akidas, and what is, the, what is the difference between them, and uh, then we can uh, dive into the... Well, uh, to, sure, for, the, for our purposes, let's bundle the Ash'ari and Maturidi into one, okay, because the, by the time we get to their differences, you, we, we would have entered, like, not just the secondary not tertiary fourth level of detail so for this purpose of right, this discussion actually maturidi put it as one so now you have two and the difference is from how i understand it as it was taught to me by different hanbali scholars very simply is like this when a question came up a new question in theologically related came up okay the hanabila said these questions were not brought up in the time of the Prophet وسلم, or the first three generations. We don't want to answer them. We don't want to get involved in this because there's no precedent. 
Like there's no way to be one to know you're one hundred percent sure of the answer. So the Hanabila will say, the moment that you begin discussing these questions that never came up before, okay, we get we will get up and leave the room. What what are the questions like when we talk about the attributes of Allah or questions about uh, questions about let's say um, <clears throat> the role of logic in in, in religion, the co seeming contradictions between certain verses even, okay, this, the apparent contradictions of certain verses, philosophical questions, okay. These types of things that the either atheists brought or people from their mind brought about. Okay. Questions like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that he's with us wherever we are, but also that he's above the throne, but also that he comes down to the lowest heaven in the last third of the night. So how does he do all this and where actually is he? Right? Such a question is brought by maybe Iblis, maybe just a curious human mind, right? Could be innocent. But the Hanabila, from as I understand it, okay, and I wish there was a Hanbali to correct me if I'm wrong, but this is pretty much what Hats, Sheikh Hatsim al Hajj and Sheikh uh, Yusuf bin Sadiq said. They would abstain from the discussion. Let me take my religion as I believe it and leave the room. Now, the Ashara and the Matudidiyah said, no, we have to answer this question. Okay. If Iblis brought a whole new book of questions, we have to answer every single one of them. We cannot leave a single question. Okay. So based upon that, that's the number one difference between the two. Okay. Now, in order to answer these questions, the Asha'ira also came with another concept, is that if Allah is the creator of the intellect, and he's the creator of the world, and he's the revealer of the Quran, there can never be a contradiction between these two, these three things. And when we say intellect, we're talking about universal intellect, Quranic logic. We're not your generic human logic. We're not talking about any logic pertaining to any civilization. Okay, we're simply talking about the generic human logic that Allah Taala commands us to use. Do you not think the type of human logic that is the prerequisite of being mukallaf? Okay, mukallaf be mainly like. If you don't have this 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 basic reasoning, okay, then pretty much we have to judge you as insane. Okay, if you genuinely think that the part is bigger than the whole, or that five is greater than ten, we have to deem you insane, right? So this is Quranic and universal and fitri logic, not any other kind of logic. These three things must always be in line with one another. Okay, and any time that it would appear that revelation contradicts either of these two, then that revelation was meant at always to be interpreted differently, not on its face in its literal value. If this is Imam Al Ghazali saying this, and then he says that anyone who says no to this says no, that revelation, nature as we see it, and reason can contradict, and we will judge the revelation on its face, this is more of an enemy to religion than his friend. Okay? Because he will result in widespread fitna of people feeling that our deen makes no sense. Okay? So that is, these are the two main principles. When we talk about Ash'ari, when we see the word Ash'ari, these are the two main principles. So principle number one, any question that a philosopher atheist brings, we have to answer it. Even not us, the scholars will answer it. Number two, Revelation, reason, and the world around us, okay, what we observe in reality can never contradict themselves because they have one creator. Therefore, they must be in line with one another. And it is Allah himself who says, if this book was from other than Allah, you would find in it much contradiction. So there's no contradiction in the book and there's no contradiction between his creation. Okay, so those are the two principles that we operate based upon. Doesn't Imam uh, Hanbal say that Allah exists without a place as well? I believe that there are quotes on that, and I saved a lot of them. I do believe that uh, something there, there he has tenzihi quotes like that. I, I could probably look them up. Right. So what is then the athari? Uh, because athari means basically there's a fiqh of Imam Hanbal, and then there's also like the sort of a creed. 
uh, and then but it's kind of confusing if it's compared to like Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, because many people okay, reference so, him. Go ahead. Yeah. So the the Hanabila, as I said, they said, gentlemen, Jazakumullah khairan, we're not going to discuss this. We're leaving the room, right? Like in a board meeting, when you discuss something that I don't really want to get, I want, I don't want to have a vote. I don't even want to hear it. You you abstain. So Ibn Taymiyyah did not abstain. He actually felt that his elders. And this is in the fatawa of Ibn Taymiyyah that he felt that in usul they were not correct in this. They were not correct not to defend their position. Okay. Um, so he actually uses his own logic to argue the positions of the Atharis or the Hanbalis. So he actually parted ways. And I'm not, this is not my own words. This is, again, I did the two podcasts, two long podcasts which were very educational to me with Sheikh Yusuf bin Sadiq and Sheikh Hatim al Hajj. They both stated he parted from the Hanbali way of Aqidah. He delved into these matters in defense of the uh, Han Hanbali opinion against the Ashari opinion. Okay. So I would say that he is different from, in Aqidah, he is different from the Hanabila. He is his own Aqidah. Right. And yet, yes, he's, he has, he's, I, I would I guess this, uh, I would say the best way to put it is he's defending the Hanbali Aqidah, but he ends up with different conclusions, more specific conclusions that don't exist in other Hanbali books, and he argues against them. So this is this is what I've come to understand about Ibn Taymiyyah from the Hanabila himself. So the Taymiyyah Aqidah mm -hmm. is different. It is argumentative. It, argumentative, I'm saying that it's in the discourse. As the Ash'aris are in the discourse with the philosophers, the Hanabid are in the uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and his followers are in discourse against the Ash'aris and the philosophers. So mm -hmm. that's the difference. Whereas the Hanabid so, would say, no, we're not doing any of this. Right. But the, the people who say they are Ash'aris and they go into these discussions and say, Allah has a hand. Yeah. Right. So what are they? Uh, are they following more the Ibn Taymiyyah or is it the Hanbali? Uh, no, that's, that 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 would be the uh, approach of Ibn Taymiyyah because the approach of the Hanabila is to recite the verse and that's it. And right. even specifically, they don't extract anything; just recite the verse as it is because you can't remove the the sifa from the context of the verse. Mm -hmm. I just watched your interview with Sheikh Amin from New Jersey, and yep. uh, he mentioned uh, the Hanbali scholar Muhammad Ibn Ahmad Safarini, where he mm -hmm. goes into like discussion on how Hanbalis define uh, if Allah has a body or particle. And it seems pretty similar to Ashari. Like I couldn't find like much difference there uh, compared to like Correct. when you go to Ibn Taymiyyah or some other people. Correct. And I have a number of quotes uh, that I've saved from Hanabila who have very clearly Tanzihi statements. They make Tanzih. They base Tanzih is the concept of... Um, disavowing any human likeness or created likeness because what do we mean by created thing we mean by that that the attributes of being created is that you are bound by time and space that's the attribute of a created thing that you are bound to have a beginning that you are bound to change that you are bound to take up space okay so yeah. that's what we mean that he's different from his creation many people get confused and say, hold on, how is he different from creation? Creation exists and Allah exists. So we say that's different. When we, when there's a shared attribute between the creation and the creator, the difference is not in the existence of the attribute. The, exi the difference is in the absoluteness and the dependency of the attribute. So he exists without support. He exists without a beginning. Okay. We exist with a beginning and with support. Like I have needs. I have to breathe. I have all these things and Allah created me. So that's the difference. So I say, I have love and Allah loves. Allah says clearly in the Quran, he loves. And I love. What's the difference? Well, the difference is I love for a need. I love food. I need it. Right. I love things that I don't have. Okay. That I that I want. And Allah Ta'ala loves without any of these things. So that's an example. I, my, I love changes. Our love is whimsical. I might love a person one day. Next day, I just, for some reason, don't like him. There's no reason. I just don't like him anymore. Okay? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love is not whimsical. 
it's with truth and justice and fairness. So those, so when there's a shared attribute, <coughs> the difference is in the absoluteness and the neediness and the dependency. When there, when we say that he's unlike his creation, it means in the essence of what makes something a created thing. Every created thing has is bound by time and place, has a beginning, and changes. That's what we mean that Allah's mm -hmm. transcendent. So any attribute that would seem to make God bound by time and place, we must negate it. We don't negate the attribute. We negate the literal meaning of the attribute. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. No, there's not an Ash'ari ever who negates an attribute. He negates the literal interpretation of that attribute. Right. So I can already see some comments like, you guys are dividing the Ummah by this and uh, people don't stay away from Ash'aris. Like, uh, guys, I'm just trying to find out for myself what I'm believing. Like, uh, and I want you to take, to take with me. Like, uh, I've been doing this for four years from conversion to this point. So it's, for me, it's like good to to discuss these things. And I don't have a, I don't have a particular view. I'm just trying to learn about everything. And of course, I, I, I lean one way or another, but uh, I'm not going to stay well, away from question. either Salafis or Ashari's. Like, I want to hear from both. Like, what, what's going on? Well, the question is not emotional allegiance. The question is evidence. Yeah. Right? That's the question. Yeah. It's about evidence. And it's about precedent, too. If there's a misguidance in the Ummah, you're not going to find 70% of the scholars upon it. Right. That would mean right. the religion wasn't clear. And if you yeah, have yeah. A, a big division, like 60, 40 or 50, 50, that probably means that this is not a primary mess, uh, issue in the religion. And whichever way you die, whichever one you die upon will have its basis and will be acceptable mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is, like every one of uh, the groups claims to be Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. I'm like, OK. What does that actually mean? They have different definitions. <laughs> like, okay. So for convert, it's like even more difficult. Like what's going on? So then I read like, okay, I'm going to read the classical scholars instead of the new ones. Because I want to hear what they said. If they are the Salaf, right? So like, yeah, let me read their books. Or at least like basics. Like I'm not even talking about like some... I don't re read Arabic, so I'm just reading the translation. But even that is like, that gives yeah. me enough uh, evidence where I can kind of see what, what they were upon. So... For me, it's well, like know, interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the, the 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 interesting points is that in theology, in fiqh, in everything, there are always new questions. Okay. So the early books will look very different from the later books because the later books are answering questions that didn't exist in the first books, right? Yeah. I mean, so the first books are against Mutazila and groups that are no yeah. not relevant today. So basically, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So it's almost like reading a book on disease from the 1500s and a book on diseases from today, right? The study of diseases. The, today's diseases, half of them didn't exist in the 1500s, probably 70%. And which is why when a person studies, it's extremely important for them to study the timeline, right? So when you study a scholar, it, it's not like a we're today and all of Islam was in the past. No, there is a gradation. There are questions that came up at the end, in, even in fiqh, right after the death of Imam Malik, that his students had to answer, okay? There are questions that came up 100 years later, okay, that were radically different. So as a result of that, let's just say in fiqh, okay, the works of Malik will not provide you with everything you need, okay? The first major book in Maliki fiqh will not provide you with everything you need because new questions came up. It's the same in Aqidah. New yeah. questions. Philosophers it's are like, bringing... Yeah. It's like today the most common issue is LGBT or all these things that never existed yeah. before. Or it, it wasn't like that interesting or important for people to even tackle. So And now it's like the, the most... <laughs> the big thing. And now yeah. go 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 to the early fic books and look for a, the the solution to the transgender issue. How do we treat a transgender person? Well, they had the biologically transgender that he was born with. It wasn't even trans. He was born with two genders, right? Uh, two, two organs. That's it. That's all they had. They'd never had, way back in the early days, a man purpose in telling the society that he's a woman. That person would have been put into an insane uh, asylum back in the day, right? So uh, in the same vein, there are new questions that come up. Now, there's another thing that we have to discuss here. 
there are primary issues in our religion and there are secondary ones. These secondary ones, mistakes in them, don't always have the same danger as mistakes in the first one. Okay. So the primary level questions are those that you will be asked about in the grave, those that every Muslim has to, uh, uh, to know. The secondary questions are questions where uh, if, you, if the scholar gets the answer wrong, Allah says you still get one reward. Okay. And if he gets it right, he gets two rewards. What are those two rewards? He gets a reward in the afterlife and he gets the reward of in the future, the scholars will say you are correct. He will be deemed correct in this life. Right. So how will he be deemed correct? Because the after effects or what we call the lawazim. Lawazim is the domino effect. So if if you say this, that means this is true, this is true, this is true. Okay? These are called lawazim. So if you're wrong, then eventually it will be shown, okay, by the results of that, that you're that that you there's an inconsistency. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's where the two rewards come from. You get two rewards, double the reward. You get a reward in this life and a reward in the next life. Right. So looking at the more maybe controversial thing, I'm going to quote to you a statement from an Athari uh, mm -hmm. about the Asharis. And I want you to maybe tell me what, what do you think? Because it's about Yad, the hand as a body part. And I'm just I'm just really trying to understand it from maybe from your point of view, even though you might be biased because you already have a Akida and Matab and everything. Right. But I still want to want to know. So he says uh, they assume the Asharis that Yad hand must be a body part. So if you accept that God has a hand, that it must mean that you believe that God has a body part. When you deny this, they think you are either talking nonsense or we are making ta'awil. It is actually them or our anthropomorphists and then they cast their own demented tasbih upon us. Everything we know of that has knowledge, has a brain. You Muslims say God has knowledge, so you're saying God has a brain. What, what's, your, what's your take on, on this sort of analogy um, okay well first because it's a the, the the yad issue is is a big issue uh yeah. because some people just say allah didn't reveal hand he revealed yad so you're attributing hand to uh, but then they say yeah it's a it's it's a hand but it's unlike created hand and some people say well what's uncreated hand so here in these intricacies i'm i'm a bit lost and these intricacies are creating huge divisions and they are like both are making takfir of each other the Asharis and Atharis, and it's like watching it is like interesting for me, but for lay Muslims, and I'm a lay Muslim, but for lay lay people who don't even know that Madhab exists, this must be very difficult to watch. So I would say that uh, what is the firstly, what is the function of the discussion? Uh, will is, is it, Are these from the matters that Allah is going to ask us about on the Day of Judgment and in our graves? So that's the first question, right? And that's going to that's gonna determine not whether or not we answer the question, it's going to determine how heated you get about this. And it's going to determine how much you spend fighting the one who disagrees with you. Okay, so that's the first measure that I want to put there for everybody, because uh, it's a, that's an important... There, there's only one thing that matters for, for a Muslim is, is this what Allah has asked me to do? So if Allah Ta'ala will not ask me about it on the Day of Judgment, that doesn't mean that there's another filter that we have to go by, right? Could a person possibly be led astray by this, right? So we have to ask the question. So so number one, I personally will, will not be asked on Yom Al-Qiyamah how I made Tawib, right? How I interpreted. I don't, I'm not going to be asked about this. That's number one. But number two, is there a possibility that somebody could somehow go astray by this or have a bad impression about the deen by this? Maybe, maybe. So in that respect, the scholars did answer the question. Now, that's number one. Number two, I'm going to propose a commonsensical and logical methodology to answer these questions. The methodology is, Allah says, we revealed this book in a clear Arabic Quran, right or wrong. So therefore, the judgment of what a word means in the Quran is the Arabic language as was known to the prophet and those before him and the companions. Okay. And then we stop there. After that, maybe Arabic changed, maybe different languages got mixed up. But what Allah testified for is that this Arabic 
is a clear Arabic tongue. So to that prof prophetic generation and those before them. So anytime that there's a word in the Quran, we have to go back to those dictionaries, those lexicons, the what the Arabs meant by this, right? So in a word like yet can have uh, multiple different meanings, right? So therefore, the argument would be, why would I have to choose one over the other? If the if someone brings me five different definitions of the yet, then why is it that I would insist that it's one over the other? Do you, do you know what these maybe different definitions are? Like, for example, the yet can be power. The yet can be strength, or it could be favor. Like I owe you a favor, okay? The yet can be the wrist to the fingertips, the elbow to the fingertips, the shoulder to the fingertips. So I just gave you five definitions right there. So now it would make sense that if one would not suit the rest of Allah's description of himself, then that must not be the correct answer, right? So for example, does not Allah say he's ahad and samad? So what is ahad? Ahad is he's one in himself. This is the meaning of the word قُلْ وَاللَّهُ أَحَدْ He's one in himself. He has no parts. So if a yad in any definition implies a part, a limb, in any of these definitions, okay, then we say it cannot be that one. Okay. Now, someone may say, and some it, like you mentioned, oh, he has knowledge, therefore knowledge is in the brain. No, he has knowledge without a tool. He sees without a, a, a tool. He does not need a tool to see. He grasps without a tool. He hears without ears. Okay? So he's summit. He's independent of tools. We only can attain these qualities if we have tools. We can only become hearing if I have a tool. That's us. But Allah hears without any ears because he is summit, absolutely independent. Okay? So now let's ask this question. Oh, by the way, we're not allowed to admit new meanings. If a meaning is not there with the Arabs, we're not adding a new meaning. We're not adding an uncreated hand. This where, where did the Arabs ever use this? We're not adding that. So we'll put an X there. Now we go to the third question. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to us in this manner that would cause confusion? Right? Number one, you don't ask what, why Allah does things. A Muslim does not ask why. لا يسأل عما يفع. He's not asked about what he does. Number two, he has the right to test us. Did Allah not test the, the, the Bani Israel and the Christians and, and the followers of Isa bin Maryam by someone who looked like Prophet Isa on the cross? That was a test. Allah tests us by telling us that the Isra and Mi'raj, he tested Quraysh with Isra and Mi'raj, that the Prophet went to Jerusalem and back. He tested them by telling them there is a tree in hell. How does a, a wooden tree grow out of, in a fire? Wouldn't it burn? Right. So number two, answer number two is Allah has the right to test us. Answer number three, Allah warned us. In Surah Ali Imran, he says there's mutashabih. Mutashabihat, a verse that looks one way, but it actually has a different meaning. Or it's confusing to a person. So he's telling us that there is a test. These mutashabihat, and ask the scholars that what are the mutashabihat? It's this attribute of Allah. Number four, wisdom, which is mentioned in the podcast with Sheikh Hatim and Hajj. He said, the Qur'an is anthropocentric, meaning it's speaking to human beings. So it's speaking to them in a language that they can understand. Okay? And therefore, we take that as the meaning of the general meaning of the verse, okay? not as a specific literal meaning to his attribute. All right. So those are four possible uh, uh, reasons or, or comments about why such verses exist. That, in the summary, is the Ash'ari approach to the Sifat. Okay, so to repeat, the so methodology... So is that, is that called Tawil, or is that... Well, how would you... Okay. There's three three ways yeah. of doing this, right? So if so, you, you can do one of three things that are acceptable in the Ash'ari position. The first one is to say, like the Hanbalis, but you're going to say, number one, I did not, I deny any meaning that negates his transcendence, that he has a part, that he's in a location, that he's bound by time. Okay? That's called tenzi. I'm negating that. I disavow from all this. 
These contradict the Quran. These beliefs contradict the Quran. Right? The belief that Allah has a parts, that he has a limb, that he's in a place, all this contradicts the Quran. As for what the what it means, I, I stop there. And we call this position tafweed. The second ta'wil can divide into two types. The Hanabila accept one and they reject one. The first ta'wid is of the general meaning of the verse, right? Yadullahi ma'al jama'a, for example, a hadith, the hand of Allah is with the group. All right, the blessing of Allah is with the group. The general meet ta'wil of the general verse is acceptable to them. They allow that. And the asha'ira also allow the second type, which is the ta'wil of the word itself. That yad here means power or it means favor. Isn't like that, that maturidis already? Like they they and the put the thing. meaning. Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They they will allow tawid for the uh, meaning, uh, the word itself. And why do they do this? They do this for the one who could possibly get confused. So therefore, it's better for him to um, uh, be given the tawid of what the meaning is, so that he doesn't have an idea about Allah that's not true. Mm -hmm. So I want to yeah. recap really quick. Just to recap really quick, the first thing we ask ourselves is. We have to ask ourselves, is this from the things that Allah is going to ask us about in the grave? Okay. And if not, that determines how much we're going to go into it and how much we're going to fight with those who disagree with us. Number two, okay, is what is the methodology? I'm only, we're only allowed to do tafsir by the Arabic of the time of the Prophet or before him, right? No new words are admitted into the into the Arabic language. No new meaning. You can't create your own meaning. Number three is that if any of these meanings contradict another verse of Quran or another teach, teaching in a, in a mutawatir hadith, then that meaning is not the correct tafsir. Simple as that. Principle number four, we must negate uh, th those meanings and we don't have to answer. We don't have to continue making interpretation. I can stop right there. I can say as long as uh, I can say, I don't know what it means, but I know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean anything that contradicts the Quran. So yeah. so if I if I say, uh, as an example, Allah has a hand, but it's in his majesty. Like it's not like our hand, but in his majesty. Or I hear this a lot. What What yeah. is that in terms of these? Oh, I would say about that um, that such a person has uh, has if he if he holds that their Allah is unlike anything of his creation, then khalas, he's uh, we can't say he's guilty of anything. Although, mm -hmm. if he what he what he means by yet he didn't specify, so he didn't really say anything. Mm -hmm. Right, he didn't specify. What does he mean by that? Okay. We should say to the more precise at wording, rather than he has a yet, is he has attributed to himself the attribute of yet. And even better than this is to simply recite the verse. This is what I love about the the that opinion we talked about earlier. Don't remove the attribute from the verse, right? Put it in the verse. Simply say, okay, uh, the verse that you're talking about, whatever is the verse, okay. Yeah. Allah says about to, to say Adam, just say the verse and say, This is what I believe. That's it. You don't have to interpret any further. You'll never be asked about this in the grave. Mm -hmm. But you just believe in the verse. That's it. Yeah. And we have a translation of the Quran in Slovak and how they do like Istiwa and all these things. Like they just keep it in Arabic. So they say, like Allah rose above Istiwa. And they say it in Arabic just to, I guess, just yeah, to be safe. Yeah. 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 And I guess that's a that's that should be like pretty safe for for yeah. for keeping it like that. But anyways, it, it's just an issue that I was thinking about. But uh, I have maybe just a couple of more questions more about sure. our masjid here. So um, a, I've talked to some of the scholars and they said it's impossible to unite on the madhab because, for example, my friend is Maliki, I'm Hanafi, and we have people from all over the world and they have their own ways of praying, you know, and we start, it's alhamdulillah it started one year ago with two people now we have over 25 people and uh we're gonna do you know taraweeks ramadan uh we're gonna do iftars we even had a wedding nikah 
Uh, we're trying to build our community. We're making sure people make hijra to these locations so we can be together, the Muslims converts, because it's very difficult. And uh, so I, I already know, like, okay, we can make these general kind of rules, but everyone's going to have their own shed, that's their fine. own madhab. That's, no that's for yeah. sure not going to change. I got, uh, but, I got, we go got ahead. a policy. We're not saying this is how you have to live, but this is how this institution is being run. That's it. Why? Because it's not going to, we're not here. We can't please everyone. We're going to follow a methodology that seems to make sense. Right. And in the public matters, everything that affects everybody, this is what we're going to have. When we bring a teacher, the teacher will have X, Y, and Z qualities. That's it. Why? So there's no confusion. Right. So we could have a Shafi'i class, a Maliki class, a Hanafi class, but the, the Masjid, when it runs something, it will run it by the Hanafi rules. Simple yeah. as that. Right. We're not saying that this is the only truth. We're not saying you have to follow it. All right. So you have a policy for what you do and you have a policy for the microphone. Who is allowed to speak and who is allowed to give classes? You should make That's sure in the future. Yeah. Yeah. In the future. Yeah. We had one. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll make sure there's no contradiction in the message. It's going to cause confusion. Yeah. My my one question is, I've seen mm -hmm. this a lot uh, with new Muslims. Um, they come into Islam. We have, I had like five Shahadas, uh, which Mashallah. is amazing. And mm -hmm. uh, the problem is they're sort of, you know, they make the Shahada and they're sort of swimming in the ocean alone. Like there's no help. I, mm -hmm. I actually made a comparison like Islam is like a really bad product. If you, if I compare it to the business world, like it has the worst onboarding journey, uh, the sales oh, and the marketing worst. doesn't work. It's the uh, worst. Like There's the marketing no is horrible on, on TV. Islam is for terrorists. You know, it's like the worst marketing, the worst sales. There's no help, no onboard, no customer service. So the people who survive this struggle will be like strong. But a lot of yeah. people leave. And subhanAllah, even today, I have a friend who married... Uh, muslim convert and she just left islam she made kufr like she just said she doesn't believe in it and subhanallah it's just because they have no basic like okay they can come to conclusion there's a creator or something but a lot of people are missing basic education especially here in our language okay not everybody speaks english so i was wondering is there a way you would uh, be or is there a way we would be able to create like a small booklet for new muslims what is your belief what is Islamic belief, like yeah. just a small, let's say you have uh, Al Fiqh Al Akbar from Abu Hanifa, but just a small condensed version, like one pager, like this is the this is what this is what is Islam. Because they let's say they they do the Shahada. I believe in the Creator and I believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but they don't know. There's actually okay. Do you believe in the Day of Judgment? Do you believe in this? Do you believe in Munkar and Akir? Do you? Be, and we can go. You, we, I can list so many things, and they are like, what? I didn't sign up for this. You know, like I I don't even know about these things. So I don't, these shahadas I see online, I don't believe them. Like, I think they're not real, but I think these people will have to study Islam one way or another. Like somehow yeah, alone they gotta, or, yeah, it's just it going to happen. That truly what the what Allah said, or the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, paradise is surrounded with hardships. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems to be like, as you said, the onboarding, it's not an onboarding process. It's, it's um, hunger games, right, that you have to go through in order to secure, be secure in the deen, how many fitness will anyone who starts coming into this deen immediately face? How many fitness will they face? So, but the result is those who tru truly stay consistent with it, they're going to be much stronger. And it's not to say that these are good, these are bad, but I don't think that any book or video is going to do the job. What's going to do the job is personal connections. So you, what your message is, is doing is going to foster the ability to 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 make friends, yeah. the ability to talk, the ability to develop your family there. Converts will, any convert message will eventually one day not be a convert message. Why? Because you, when you're uh, uh, in 20 years, you're going to have a kid who's 15, right? You're going to have a kid. Years, he's he's, he's going to be 21. But yeah. He's going to be 21. He's not a convert. Well, yeah. He's not a convert. Yeah, he's born, born Muslim, alhamdulillah. Born Muslim. So every convert masjid, you can be as convert friendly as you want, but you will not be a convert masjid in 20 years because your kids themselves, you're not leaving the masjid. You're not going to say, okay, if I'm not a convert, I can't run the masjid. No, it's not going to work like that, right? Yeah. So it's just going to be a masjid, maybe friendly to convert or uh, ethnically Slovakian masjid. That's, that's, actually, what, that's what it is. It's, it sounds racist. It sounds racist, but that's actually what brought people here. 
is because the there are five masjids in the country and they're all run by you know foreigners so people naturally are scared i, I was scared when i was taking my shahada i didn't want to go to the like underground arabic masjid which is beneath like a subway like it's yeah. always these weird places uh especially if you know like and and, and the culture is off like they're screaming and like what is this? like I we totally... are very like we are very conservative we don't like touching we don't like just leave me alone uh like and uh, this was like very off-putting but i was like i'm i don't care I, i care about the truth but i i guess many people are put off by that but here uh... we are like uh slovak guys who are running it And we've been on Dean for a couple of years, so it's like we can also help people. And we've yeah. done some lectures and things like that. And as you said, like if there's a vision, like as we said, like let's make this place a place of hijra for us. Like if you let's let's make connect, let's make babies. Like let's yeah. make the ummah so that in 10 years our kids will be here and we can be not we can be like 500 instead of yeah. 25. By the end of this year, I want to have 100 people here so that subhanAllah we can have 500. And I've seen these things in the UK, like they have a, there's a great mosque, in, not in London, in like a small town, because we're not in the capital, and they focus yeah. on reverts, and like they have a different approach to Islam, because you need it here, like this is the most Islamophobic country, I'm telling you. So, wow. of course, you will need some some different way of doing things. I um, totally, yeah. uh, I'm in total support of um, ethnic masajid where it's needed, right? I mean, if I move to China... Yeah. I made hijra to China. The first thing that I would do, if I was forced to live in China, first thing I would do is open a masjid for English speakers. Mm. What would be the value of me going to a masjid that speaks a different language? Of course, there's value. I'll, they're my ummah, they're my brothers. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, there's there's limited benefit. Right? Yeah, you, you can make your prayers and maybe Juma and that's it. That's like, it. There's nothing else. Yeah, I don't relate so, to anything. Their history, nothing. Yeah. The 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 migrant immigrant uh, world, I I'm now an immigrant. I want to share that with other immigrants, right? Yeah. Uh, sense of humor, food, all these things, marriage, all these things. So I'm totally in support of a concept of the of a masjid established with the culture. And you're not saying that no one's welcome. That's the difference. You're not saying Arabs not welcome. But you're saying when we do things in this masjid in the same way that we made a fiqh decision, we made a decision. That we're going to be Hanafis. Likewise, when we do things, it's going to be in the Slovak language. Uh, yeah. It's going to be with Slovak culture. When we have Iftar and Ramadan, it's going to be Slovaki food, or the, whatever, whatever that is, right? So yeah. whatever it is that that is of the culture, like that, to, to me, it makes total sense because yeah. you need to. It's not going to really about convert and not convert. It's about Slovak and not Slovak. Yeah, That's, I think you know like, we have. We have people from Africa here. We have people who are from Gaza, from Palestine, actually. Like, we have yeah. people from Gaza here. We mm -hmm. have people from all over the world, from Algeria, from... Uh, and they're praying behind me, which is insane. Like, yeah. you know, I'm do I'm doing the uh, the prayer and I'm yeah. like a convert and they are born Arabs. Like, it's so insane. But yeah. this is like... Hey, it happens. Where I, I mean, yeah. it happens and you have and you need that. Uh, a convert comes in. He ne he needs a Slovak uh, culture. Like why why mm. give him two hurdles now? Why give him a Islamic hurdle and a cultural hurdle? He just changed his religion. Leave the change to one thing: his religion. He now yeah. should not have to change his clothes. He should not have to change his diet. He should not have to change his cuisine. He should not have to change his mannerisms. Right? Okay. Like you said, some people are very touchy and loud and. And, and and you get in your business right away, right? Maybe that's not their culture. So the change should be as minimal as possible. Yeah, we just had last week a guy who came, a Slovak guy came from Morocco and he became Muslim there. And they changed his name. They gave him uh, Moroccan clothes. Oh, <laughs> and they they so pimped much. him out. They pimped him out. And he was oh. like, should I do this? And I'm like, no, don't worry. Like, uh, you're still the same. You can wear the same things. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. That, so that, these things so happen. It happens. And tell me something. What is your, um, what's the name of your YouTube channel? It's a Jan the Slovak Muslim. So it's, okay. uh, uh, it's the only Slovak Muslim that exists on YouTube. But yeah. SubhanAllah. Uh, mashallah. And, and, but you, you're in Slovakia. Does everyone speak English? Second language? Yeah. Yeah. Most people speak English. Yeah. Because yeah. all your podcasts are going to be in English, right? Yeah. Everything is in English. So I spoke with uh, 
I spoke with many people of knowledge, but uh, typically I do just vlogs and things like that when I was in Mecca or Medina or um, different type of content. I usually don't delve into Akida that much. So people might be like, why are you doing this? But hey, I'm, I'm also learning myself and it's something like I need to learn. It's not like I have a choice. I have a choice not to do anything, but I don't want to keep stagnant in the Dean. I think that's the worst thing. Like, because yeah, like what you just do your Farite and that's it. Like you that's like nothing like yeah. and uh, you have to kind of improve i'm not saying you have to do yeah. it now but like i've been established so i i i, I can improve you know I, it's not yeah. like i no you have to you have to constantly be learning i mean otherwise uh haraka baraka we say movement brings blessing mm -hmm. and the best movement is, the best movement is to move on the trodden path like that which has you can say if allah was to ask me why did you do this i'm going to say oh allah 100,000 ulama were upon this, right? Mm. 50,000 scholars, all your great, the great scholars, they did this, right? So that's the best path. You're going to be 100% innocent. You're going to be on the right track, even in matters of disagreement, right? Mm -hmm. It's enough. They were upon it, right? If they made a mistake, I would have definitely made the mistake. And if they made a mistake, it'll be forgivable because they're, they made sound ijtihad and so many people agreed with them. Yeah, so that's it's the just best. about knowing where you are because uh, it's not the best to study the dean in the beginning because uh, it will be overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's also a way of, uh, you know, first two years, like many people leave Islam, like this reality. So focus on just creating your identity, like connections with Muslims, locals, your family, all that stuff has to be done before uh, doing this stuff. But this is also necessary, but you have to know when to dive deeper into this and you really have to commit. Like I'm studying daily, let's say one hour. So yeah. uh, in like one year, I can go through all your arc view, right? So I can have a better understanding of the Dean. And then yeah. I can start do learning the Arabic. Like I know how to read, but I don't know what I'm saying properly. Like, you know, so. And uh, I have to say that if you weren't on Twitter, you wouldn't be exposed to half the stuff. I know. Twitter is a mess. I, I, I think that Twitter, it's um, a snake playground for shaitan. And brings out, it brings out, it takes a matter that is not one of the matters that um, one will be asked about. It's not one of the matters that requires us to break ranks with another person. Mm -hmm. And it makes it one of those. Yeah. Right. It, it may really pulls the worst uh, out of the community, in my opinion. And that's why uh, for the second time, and I think this is probably the final time, I decided, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write my books, make my videos. And the team will put it out there, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go into the, the foray with people. And as much as possible, I'm going to stick to the matters that Allah and his messenger directly commanded us will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. That doesn't mean I don't have an opinion on other things, but that opinion should take percent, maybe 2% or 5% mm -hmm. of the discussion. It shouldn't be the whole discussion, yeah. for sure. I mean, but there's also a way, like we had the Madhali here. And you know Madhalis. <laughs> and so it was like, I was like, give him time, guys. Like, he will, like, let's not, let's not make, like, I hate fighting amongst the Muslims. Even we have Quranists, people who don't even, <laughs> don't even uh, acknowledge Hadith. Like, guys, this is like not acceptable. But let me, let me just say, I disagree with you. Uh, and they are running like Facebook groups. They're really influential here. Like, it's crazy. So I was like, subhanAllah, uh, let me just wait. And a couple of years went by and I was able to, go on a trip with a Madhali and a Sufi. Can you imagine this? Well, Ajib. Well, when you're so small... And they, 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 they sort of like... When you're so small, you see the reflection of the Ummah. So we have, you know, we have the Salafis, we have the Madhalis, we have the Sufis, we have people who are uh, sort of in the Madhavs, we have people who just do the Quran, we have people who are like complete liberals. And there's like a thousand. That's max. Mm -hmm. And you see like everything. Like, subhanAllah. There must... But even if there's so many ways, there must be a proper path to study Islam. This is what I was yeah. looking for. Like, this cannot be this disorganized. There's no way. Well, here's the and, thing. Too. Uh, num number one is when you're such a small group, uh, you you can't afford to to separate. So people do can come and t sort of tolerate each other. And they mm -hmm. develop a really nice uh, level of tolerance, number one. But number two, I'll tell you which the truth is that which will survive. All right. So you don't you can't judge by this generation, your kids generation. The kids who came out balanced, good, sound, overall, it's not going to be 
that will tend to be what is what is correct because what it, it's correct works and it gets transmitted through the generations. What's false eventually will break down. Quranism breaks down in one generation, guaranteed. Yeah. They have no way to, to pass on the religion. Other movements, the more extreme the movement, maybe it lasts one or two generations, right? But that which, or in order to survive, it has to close itself off. So some movements, in order to survive, they will survive many generations, but they have to close themselves off. That's a sign of falsehood. Yeah. So that which grows and lasts generations upon generations, and it grows, that's the truth, right? Mm. That's what's going to, that, that, that is the attribute of the truth. And that's why we're upon these four methods, because every generation, they're growing. They may not look like they're growing on Twitter, but they are growing. They're increasing in numbers uh, every mm. generation, and it's lasted all this time. So I don't need to go and reinvent the wheel. Hmm. Yeah, it's just uh, in reality, we're the only yeah. ones with the masjid. The all the other groups are online, so that's the online. But yeah. what are they doing in reality? Not much, you know. I want to um, see how your kids come out. I want to see how yeah. your grandkids come out. You know, those are the real questions that uh, really reflect the truth. Yeah, I think like physical meetings, actually, like mm -hmm. trips or all these things are important. They connect people, yeah. even with different like madhabs or whatever opposite views. They'll connect uh, because online it's just like nasty and you tuck feed after two comments, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is, this is not good guys. Let's go on a trip. <laughs> let's, let's no, let, some... let me tell, let me tell yeah. you the difference too. I, uh, in the, in the old days, they would have said, oh, you're a jahil, right? May Allah guide you in a nasty way, right? Today they're cursing like they're in, uh, from the streets. Oh, look yeah. at this feed dog. Look at this Wahhabi pig, right? It's like, what the heck is going on here? The level of mm. the discourse has gone so bad. Uh, it's it's gone, it's become so ridiculous. It's almost something that you am I in the same ummah here? Yeah. Right? Even like yeah, the, yeah. the just the way of the way that people go about their uh disputation is almost disgusting. Yeah, and people don't really check their egos. I think it's all egos, so just do yeah. some tasky enough. Get yeah. over yourself. Um, yeah, well, Jazak uh Dr. Shadi, this was a great. And if you ever come to Slovakia, we will be more than uh, happy to welcome you because the other, uh, let's say, co-founder of the masjid is a Maliki, so he obviously Mashallah. would like to yeah. would like to speak with you maybe about what's his stuff, name. His uh, his name is Yurai. Yurai. <laughs> um, Tonight, so do I know him? No, no, you don't because he doesn't speak English. Oh, but I'll okay. send I'll send him this clip. He will be very happy because I've sent so, him a couple of your videos and he watches them with the Russian translations. Like there's a way to catch them on YouTube. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a slog, but he never learned English. And yeah, it's just the work you're doing at Safina Society is amazing. All your interviews, and I think you're the only one on YouTube who like goes into these topics and it's not toxic. Mm. Uh, so I really enjoy that because. Uh, in the past few years, it was like really horrible. All these refutations after, you know, it's like after some time, I'm just turn it off. I need to worry about myself. And yeah, yeah last time I, I was driving five hours to Austria. I was just listening to you. Um, I don't know what was the topic, but it was so funny. Like you were making some dua and then you went straight to apostasy. <laughs> like making the dua <laughs> straight. It was like all these jumps, you know, I like that. Like you're able to just go from one topic to another. Uh, so yeah, great stuff. Alhamdulillah, look, if you guys come to America, uh, please make sure you come to Jersey. I was in New Jersey, but uh, yeah, just for a few oh, days. You came before? When was that? Yeah, I lived in the US. I lived in uh, Minnesota. I lived in Alaska. I lived in oh, Utah. Wow. Mashallah. With Mormons. Nice. So, so you know your way around America then? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my, even my businesses, I, my, all of my clients are in America, so... Oh, nice. Yeah, next time you come, make sure you come. Maybe for one when we have a, a, a conference or something like that, where you see a mm. lot of people all at once. Yeah, yeah, inshallah. Well, just like look here, and then uh, let's stay okay. in touch, inshallah, if, and I would be happy to stay connected. Sounds good. Me too. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you.